Well, good morning. This morning, we're going to be doing the ministry of the word in two parts. The first part is going to be a review of the eldership seminar that we had been doing uh, for the past couple months. And the reason why we're doing that is because this evening we have an annual business meeting and one of the agenda items on that business meeting is this decision about whether or not to adopt the new constitutional amendments regarding the plurality of elders. And just to make sure that this gets as much exposure as possible to as much of the congregation as possible, we want to review a few things that we find in the scripture so that first they're fresh in our minds and we want to make sure that as, as much of the congregation as possible has been exposed to it. And so we're going to be reviewing a few things this morning briefly so that we're clear on what the scriptures have to say on this particular matter. But before we begin that, I just want to make you aware, a lot of you are already aware of our uh, Bath Road Baptist Church YouTube channel. Uh, specifically, if you uh, go to our homepage on our YouTube channel, you'll notice this page right here. Specifically, I want you to notice the banner at the top there. You have a number of tabs that you can click on there. And there's one that's called Playlists that I want to draw your attention to. And if you click on Playlists, you'll get this page right here. And it's specifically the second one from the left I want to draw your attention to. Now, if you click on the thumbnail itself, it's just going to start playing every single one of the videos. And that's not... You, you could do that if you like, but this afternoon that might be a little more than you can bear. Specifically at the bottom, it says view full playlist. So if you click on that view full playlist, you'll come up with this page right here. And particularly on this page here, you'll notice the third seminar in is the plurality of elders where we go into depths on the plurality of elder issue, the main issue that we're deciding this evening. However, you will notice that it is 55 minutes in length, and maybe you don't have 55 minutes to spare this afternoon. And so we have another option for you. Session number four, called the Authority of Elders. The first 15 minutes of the Authority of Elders is a review of the previous week. So it's a 15-minute summary of the plurality of elders that you can watch their seminar number four entitled The Authority of Elders, 15 minutes to review the plurality of elders. Then if you scroll down to the bottom and you look at the very last one, seminar number nine there called The Qualifications of Deacons, the first 10 or 11 minutes of that particular seminar goes into some of the constitutional issues, namely the current constitution we have and some of the shortfallings we believe that the Constitution has, particularly in its definition of deacons. On the one hand, it describes deacons as those who are servants. On the other hand, it describes deacons as those who are overseers of all, not most, but of all spiritual matters in the church. And so we want to make that definition a little bit more precise, and that's partly what has provoked some of our uh, decisions to make amendments in the Constitution. Not only that, but some of that is laid out in the first 11 minutes or so of seminar number nine. And so if you were to watch the first 15 minutes of seminar four, you would get a review of the plurality of elders. And then if you watch the first 11 minutes of seminar nine, then you get uh, some of the constitutional issues that we're hoping to address through these changes. And so that's about 25 minutes of your time this afternoon if that's something you would like to, to uh, review so it's fresh in your mind for this evening. Uh, I don't expect you to read three books this afternoon, but these are books that we've been uh, recommending throughout the seminar as people have been attending. Uh, the book farthest to the left, 40 questions about elders and deacons, I've found uh, particularly tremendously useful. Uh, if you think, boy, I'd like a, a transcript of these seminars that Tim's been doing by 40 Questions About Elders and Deacons by Benjamin Markle, and yeah, that's effectively what you have there, and some supplementary sources from Nine Marks, which is a tremendous resource in regards to ecclesiology, uh, their book by Jeremy Ryan on church elders, and their book from Matt Smith, well, Richard, you read the name, uh, about uh, deacons there. Um, and uh, those, are, those are much smaller resources. You can typically read those books in about three hours. But even with all of that, we still want to do a brief review in place of a corporate scripture reading this morning of the plurality of elders. And it's going to revolve your Bible, so I would invite you to open up your Bibles this morning 
rather than reading a passage, we're just going to look at a number of verses so that we're clear in our minds about what the Bible has to say, particularly the New Testament on the plurality of elders. And as you're opening up your Bibles, you can open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 11 to start with. And as you're opening up your Bibles there, we want to acknowledge a few things. Firstly, uh, as we begin to look at the New Testament evidence for elders, we want to acknowledge that there is no explicit command in the New Testament. There's no, thou shalt have a plurality of elders. You won't find that in the New Testament. So you might be wondering, what then is the argument that we're trying to make here? Well, what we're trying to say here is that every single mention of the office... Every mention that we find, and we're about to look at these things together in just a moment, but every mention that we find of the office of elder in the New Testament models a plurality of elders within a single congregation. That last part is important there. It's not just a plurality of elders throughout the the church universal, but it's a plurality of elders within the single congregation, the single local church. Conversely, There is no New Testament example of a single elder presiding, once again, over a single congregation. You'll notice house churches in parentheses. You'll see some house churches mentioned throughout the New Testament. And some say, surely there must have been a single elder within these house churches. Well, you can speculate that if you want. And perhaps it's not entirely impossible, but you can't demonstrate that from the biblical text is what we're trying to say here. Every example in the New Testament shows a plurality of elders within a single congregation without any examples to the contrary. And so let's look at a few examples together. All these examples we're going to be looking at are in order of where you find them in the New Testament, so that'll help with the flipping a little bit. First example, Acts chapter 11 and verse 30. And we're just going to run through these very quickly. We won't deal too much with the context. You can look at the videos later on this afternoon. But this is just Paul and Barnabas bringing aid to the Jerusalem elders. And in Acts 11, verse 30, we read, And they did so, sending it to, notice, the elders, plural, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. These are the elders in the church in Jerusalem. Once again, we see in chapter 14, verse 23. This is in the midst of Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And in Acts 14, verse 23, we read, And when they had appointed, notice, elders, and notice this as well, elders for them in every church, plurality of elders, singular church. And when they had appointed elders in every church with praying and fasting, etc., and so forth. Next reference, we have a whole cluster of them in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 2. This is the Jerusalem Council, and the, most of these references, if not all, I believe, are in regards to Jerusalem still, beginning in verse 2. You'll remember the whole debacle with the Judaizers, verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders, plural, about this question. Again, verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, plural. And they declared all that God had done with them. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders, plural, were gathered together to consider this matter. Verse 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And you'll notice in verse 23, the letter that was written, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, plural, to the brothers who are in the Gentiles and the following places. Acts 16, verse 4. Now Paul has gone out with Silas to uh, the region of Turkey. In verse 4, as they went their way through the cities, they delivered them for observance the decisions that was reached by the apostles and the elders, plural, 
who were in Jerusalem. So a whole cluster of them, all referring to the Jerusalem elders, all in the plural. What about Acts chapter 20? Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Now we start to see a variety of terminology beyond just the use of the word elder itself. Beginning in verse 17, now we're dealing with the church in Ephesus. Now from Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called, notice, the elders, plural, of the church, singular. Note that, the elders, plural, of the church, singular, to come to him. What did Paul say to these elders when they came to him? Well, we see in verse 28. He says to them in verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the overseer or in which the Holy Spirit has made you notice overseers. Now we got a new term. You'll notice shortly when we get to 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1, those who are aspiring not merely to the office of elder, but to the office of overseer. And what you see is these terms are used synonymously together. They're used interchangeably. An elder is an overseer. An overseer is a shepherd. A shepherd is a pastor. A pastor is an elder. These are all the exact same terms. They're synonymous. And so Paul, speaking to the Ephesian elders, says, verse 28, pay it careful attention to yourself and the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. What are they to do as overseers? Notice the next phrase, to care for the church of God. Now, you can't see it very clearly here. It's more clear in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, but the word to care there literally is the word to shepherd. To shepherd, it means to care for sheep. And so here they've rendered it care. You'll notice right above, they're to pay attention to themselves and the flock. Where are they to do for the flock? They're to care for the flock. They're to shepherd the flock. And so the elders have been made overseers, and they've been charged with the task of shepherding or pastoring. Pastoring just comes from the Latin word meaning to shepherd. Notice the Holy Spirit made you overseers, plural. And so we see the plurality of that. We see the synonymous nature of all these terms. Last one in Acts chapter 21, verse 18. Again, I know this is a little fast-paced. That's why we have the videos online, but we'll keep this moving. Uh, Acts 21, verse 18, on the following day, this is Paul, has gone on his three missionary journeys. He's just come back to Jerusalem. On the following day, verse 18, Paul went with us to James and to all, notice the elders, plural, were present. And so consistently throughout the entirety of the book of Acts, single congregation, plurality of elders. What about throughout the rest of the New Testament epistles? Well, here we'll uh, begin by noticing 1 Corinthians chapter 16. This is more of a, of a passing observation. But 1 Corinthians 16. Paul, of course, had been saying earlier in the book, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians for a while, those who are following Paul or Paulus or Cephas, and they have leaders within their own church. And Paul says at the conclusion of the letter, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Notice verse 16, Be subject to such as these, plural, and to every fellow worker and laborer. So be subject to these, plural. Plural, more of a passing observation, but we add it to the list of texts that we're looking at. Some clearer texts for us, uh, beginning in Ephesians 4, verse 11. No doubt a far more familiar text. Here we find the only noun use of the word shepherd or pastor being used in relation to the office of elder. Typically, the term elder or overseer is used. But here we have the word, the noun um, uh, pastor or shepherd, verse 11. And he, Jesus, gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists. Notice the shepherds, plural, 
and teachers, plural. Some arguments in the commentaries that shepherds and teacher can go together and call them the shepherd teachers. But nevertheless, you notice shepherds, plural, teachers, plural. Christ gave a plurality of shepherds to the church. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul introduces the letter and addresses it, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Notice, with the overseers, plural, and the deacons. Interesting here, the office of, of overseer and deacons being placed together. Nevertheless, notice with me, overseers, plural, single church, plurality of overseers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning in verse 12. We ask you brothers to respect those, plural, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them, plural, very highly in love because of their, plural, work. Notice the plurality of those pronouns. Respect those. Uh, esteem them because of their work. Plurality in these Pronouns. First Timothy chapter five, verse seventeen. First Timothy chapter five and verse seventeen. Notice the very beginning. Let the elders, plural, who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Let the elders, plural. 1 Timothy 5, 17. And we know there was a plurality of elders in Ephesus already because of Acts chapter 20. But now moving forward to Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul had gone to this place called Crete, but he left Titus behind in Crete. Why did he leave them there? Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put... I always knew I had a booming speaking voice, but <laughs> my goodness. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remains in order and appoint elders, notice plural, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Appoint elders in every town, Titus 1 verse 5. Hebrews 13 Now, the writer to the Hebrews doesn't use the word uh, elders or overseers or pastors, but rather he employs the word leaders, but still uses the word in the plural. And based off the description of the leaders, they're those who spoke to you the word of God. There are those who set an example to you. There are those who lead you. And therefore, we know we're talking about the same people. But I want you to notice the plurality beginning in verse 7, Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders... Plural, those who spoke to you the word of God consider the outcome of their way of life. Plural, their, and imitate their, plural, faith. Notice verse 17. Obey your leaders, plural, and submit to them, plural, for they, plural, are watching over your souls as those, plural, who will have to give an account. Let, let them, plural, we're being redundant, but I hope you see it here. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. One more, verse 24. Greet all your leaders, plural, and all the saints. And so a plurality of leaders. James chapter 5, verse 14. James chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders, plural, 
of the church singular, called the elders plural of the church singular, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Peter says, So I exhort the elders, plural, among you, as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. And notice what he tells these elders to do. This is the same word we found in Acts 20. Here a little bit more explicitly, verse 2, he says to the elders, plural, shepherd or pastor the flock of God that is among you. How? By exercising oversight. Once again, we see the synonymous nature of these terms. Keep your Bibles open in 1 Peter as we continue here. Uh, we're going to look at a few singular exceptions. We're not going to flip to all of these, but a few of them are already in 1 Peter 5, so we might as well notice them while we're there. Uh, we have some singular uses of the word elder. What are we supposed to do with these singular uses of the word elder? Well, we notice one of those singular uses is in 1 Peter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders, plural, among you as a fellow elder, singular. Peter is merely identifying himself. Last I checked, he's not schizophrenic. He's not more than one person. He's a single person, and he's identifying himself as a singular elder among a plurality of elders. So Peter the Apostle is also identifying himself as an elder. And if we were to flip to 2 John 1 or 3 John 1, we would see the Apostle John doing the same, identifying himself as an elder. Uh, we've already looked at 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders, plural, who rule well, be worthy of double honor. Well, we read after that the procedure for bringing a charge against a specific elder. Well, obviously, this is not negating the plurality of elders because just two verses earlier, we read about the plurality of elders explicitly. Paul is merely just saying if there is a singular elder amongst the plurality that needs to be disciplined, this is the procedure, verse 19, for bringing um, discipline against him. Uh, the term overseer we find used in the singular in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer. Well, obviously, it's not describing an individual here. It's describing the totality of the office itself, which would contain a plurality of overseers. And of course, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 7, we read of the qualifications for those specific individuals who are looking to be a part of the plurality of elders. And for those individuals, Paul says, this is the qualifications for you specifically to be an overseer in the midst of these other overseers. And those so those are the singular uses of the word elder in relation to the office. Those are the singular uses of the word overseer in the relation to the office. None of these examples either describe or justify having a singer, single elder or overseer preside over a single congregation. Well, what about the word pastor, shepherd? Those are synonymous. Pastor is to shepherd. To shepherd is to pastor. Well, we have a number of references. I'll just run through these quickly. In Matthew 9 and in Mark 6, the parallel, Jesus laments over the people because they are like sheep without a shepherd. And he uses shepherd in the singular. Every other singular reference to the word shepherd in the New Testament is not a reference to mere men overseeing the church. But every single other reference to shepherd in the singular is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is described as a shepherd who separates the sheep from the goats. In 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, also the parallel in Mark 14, 27, there's this citation of, I will strike the shepherd, singular, and the sheep will scatter, the shepherd being a reference to Jesus being struck down. Uh, In John chapter 10, of course, there's an abundance of references there. That's the passage where we find Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, singular. Once again, a reference to Jesus. Referring to Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep in Hebrews chapter... uh, I don't know if that reference is correct. Yes, it is correct. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 Uh, We read, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd, singular, of the sheep. Or referring to Jesus, if you're still open to 1 Peter chapter 5, you'll notice in verse 4, and when the chief shepherd, singular, appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. And so each of these singular uses of the word shepherd or pastor are in relation to Jesus Christ himself. And so none of these examples either describe or justify having a single pastor preside over a single congregation. Of course, uh, what about, is there any type of distinction between elders Well, the only verse that we have that deals with this in any way is 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. It's on the screen for you there. Let the elders who rule well be be worthy of double honor, especially or namely those who labor in preaching and teaching. And so there's, there's some type of distinction being drawn here. Namely, the distinction is being drawn is delineating those who are set apart vocationally because of their particular gifting and those who are not. In particular, the word honor there, let those uh, elders be uh, considered worthy of double honor, refers specifically to compensation of either a financial uh, means or some other means. You think of the word honorarium. It means to honor someone financially or through some type of gifting We actually see this used earlier in the passage in regards to widows. Honor the widows who are truly widows. And as you read throughout the rest of the passage, you know, notice that it's speaking financially. It's speaking of of benevolence. Those who are truly widows need our financial support, he says. So honor these widows. Likewise, in the very next verse, we see 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, coming right after verse 17. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves uh, his wages. And so those who are particularly rule well because of their preaching and teaching may be set apart vocationally unto this particular task. Now, Aside from the distinction between those who are vocational and those who are lay, there ought to be no distinctions between elders. Why? Because all must meet the same qualifications as found in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. All share the same responsibilities, namely to shepherd the sheep, the references there, and teaching all elders in one way or another must be able to teach. Not all are given under the, unto the gifting of preaching on a regular basis, but there's one-on-one discipleship. There's small group settings. There's various settings, uh, evangelistic settings, where they ought to be able to use the gift of teaching in some way. And so all meet the same qualifications. All share the same responsibilities. Now, the extent to which the vocational elder or the vocational elders can do this will be greater than lay elders if for no other reason than the vocational elders have more time. They don't have to work a secular job. However, giving more authority or recognition to a specific elder over the other elders implicitly creates a separate and distinct office, which you will not find in the New Testament. And this is actually done in in quite a few other churches where you have a bishop and his elders or you have a a bishop and those 
uh, who work underneath him, we want to say, no, that the bishop, which is just another word for overseer, that the bishop overseer, the pastor teacher, the elder are all synonymously describing one office and there ought not to be distinctions between them. What about term limits? This has come up for us. We've done some things in our constitution and we've had some feedback on that. And some object to term limits because there is no New Testament examples of elders having them. However, there are also no New Testament examples of elders holding office for life. There's no example of either or. Therefore, to object in either direction is to make an argument from silence. The New Testament simply does not address term limits one way or the other. Given the Bible's silence in this matter, wisdom may be exercised in order to determine what is best for the specific church. Now, the proposed Bath Road constitutional amendments do require term limits for lay elders, but not for vocational elders, since doing that for vocational elders would be logistically destructive. Why? Vocational elders are difficult to acquire to begin with. We should know this by now. But more than that, vocational elders are required to make a huge sacrifice in taking on their position, namely to relocate both themselves and their families, if they have a family, to a new city and still have to support and provide for themselves and their families once they come. And that's a really unattainable prospect when a pastor is considering moving to a new city to work vocationally at a new church. They have a wife and family they're supporting, and I may or may not have a job year, a year from now. Uh, so obviously term limits with vocational elders are logistically destructive. Thus, term limits require the vocational elders to sacrifice too much only to find themselves unemployed and unable to support their family within a short period of time. Therefore, term limits for vocational elders would not be appropriate except for special circumstances, for example, an interim pastor. Now, some, however, still object. They say that this creates an unbiblical distinction between vocational elders and lay elders. However, that distinction already exists in that vocational elders are paid and lay elders are not paid. Thus, you have a distinction no matter what insofar as that is concerned. Furthermore, there are good reasons for recommending term limits to lay elders. Let me give you three. First, it allows more men to serve. Elders ought to always be in the business of replicating themselves, of raising up the next generation. And we have plenty of examples across Ontario right now where this is not being done well, it's being done poorly, and many churches and denominations are finding themselves in large trouble trying to find those to take on the next generation because they've not been about the business of discipling and raising up. Of course, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we've dealt with a lot in the evening. I preached on it last year. Uh, that which you've learned in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men able to teach. Make the word of God generational. Raise up the next generation. This can be hindered by a lack of opportunity due to lifelong appointments. And so it allows more men to serve, but it also avoids overworking the elders. This is very simple. Those lay elders who have secular jobs and families, term limits help to provide time off to recuperate from their hectic schedules. It's more complicated to have to step down mid-service than to have uh, a time of furlough to take time off and perhaps come on at a later point, especially when you consider that they're working secular jobs and needing to spend proper amount of time with their family, which is a priority. But it also affords a method for removing ineffective elders. At the time he is selected, everything appears to be fine, or perhaps they appear to show a lot of potential. 
Later, however, it becomes obvious that this person should not have been selected to serve, perhaps a lack of gifting, motivation, or effectiveness. If this elder is called to serve for life, it might be very difficult to remove him as an elder or to assign those who might be more effective to the role. Now, with or without term limits, if somebody is to be forcibly removed from office uh, due to incompetence or, more importantly, due to disqualifying sin, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 must be implemented. 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from impartiality. In other words, with or without term limits, no one is guaranteed a lifelong position, especially when disqualifying sin comes into the equation. Now, what about the selection of elders very quickly? God's word requires that all elders meet the biblical qualifications. You can read those passages on your own time, but this is non-negotiable. It is non-negotiable. Negotiable. All elders must meet the biblical qualifications given by God through his God-breathed word. God in his word is not silent on this matter, and if others try to persuade us to lay aside the biblical qualifications, we must answer with the words of the apostle Peter who said, we must obey God rather than men. This is non-negotiable. Thus, we must not be hasty in our selection of elders, but each must be carefully examined. 1 Timothy 5.22 Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take uh, part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. By laying on hands on disqualified men, we do not keep ourselves pure, but rather we take Heart in their sin. And so qualifications, this is non-negotiable. While selecting elders, the current elders, or in our present circumstance, the deacons who are serving as overseers presently, they bear responsibility before God to ensure that these qualifications are enforced. Allow me to put Acts chapter 20 in front of you again. Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. Pay careful attention both to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, Paul says to the overseers of the church. And unfortunately, as we read in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, they did not do a particularly good job of this, and it required Timothy being sent to silence those who were perpetuating false doctrine. You begin to see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. In any case, elders are to pay attention to themselves so as not to lead the church astray. 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself and your doctrine. By this, you'll save yourself and those who are listening to you. So elders are to pay attention to themselves so as not to lead the church astray, but also they are to be alert, seeking to ensure that no wolves would gain a foothold within the church. This is important. Disqualified men need pastoral care. 
Disqualified men need mentorship. Disqualified men need discipleship, not a pulpit. This is non-negotiable. 1 Corinthians 3, how God deals with those who would cause harm to his church or seek to destroy it. This is non-negotiable. God has spoken. But also, when selecting elders, the congregation bears responsibility for what they would allow themselves to be taught. The congregation participates as well. Uh, open your, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to destroy, distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul tells the Galatians that they are responsible for judging the correctness of the message they are being taught. You'll remember the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 uh, after being taught by the Apostle Paul himself, the Brians say, in effect, hold on, Paul, we got to check this. And so we see Acts 17, 11, they were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. The cross references deal with testing the spirits of those who would prophesy to you. And so in Galatians 1, 6, Paul rebukes the Galatians who are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. While Paul would have strong words for these false teachers elsewhere, he nevertheless rebukes the Galatians for submitting to the, uh, their teaching of a false gospel. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he goes on from there, he's speaking to the churches. Note in Galatians 1, 1, that Paul does not address the, uh, the letter to the leaders or to the elders, but to the Galatian churches themselves. It was their responsibility to sit in judgment of any message presented to them as the gospel. Also, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. This is more of a description to Timothy. Paul says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, notice, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, as Paul warns Timothy about the coming tide of false teachers in the church, he didn't just mention the teachers themselves, but those who with itching ears reject the truth and surround themselves with teachers to suit their own passions. Mark Deaver, in his book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, says the following. If you are in a church where the gospel is not being preached, I hope you gain from this verse a strong sense of the responsibility you have, whether in selecting teachers or paying for them, in approving their teaching, or simply consenting to listening to them repeatedly and happily. The congregation that Paul envisioned here was culpable for the false teaching that they endured and sponsored. They were to be held guilty as those who had actually did the false teaching. Once again, we see that the final responsibility rested with the congregation itself. And there is a sense in which every single church is congregational in one sense or another in that each of these churches only exist so long as they're people who continue to participate in their activities. 
They can either vote with a ballot or they can vote with their feet and their money. Either way, the congregation will have their say. They will either surround themselves with faithful teachers and preachers of God's word, or they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Therefore, given the responsibility which is carried by both the elders and the congregation, the elders ought to be involved in vetting candidates as a part of their oversight of the church. See Acts chapter 20. But the final affirmation of all leaders must be left up to the congregation. While there are no specific examples of a congregation quote-unquote voting for elders in the New Testament, we do nevertheless see the congregation responsible for affirming and disciplining church members more generally, selecting leaders more specifically, and commissioning missionaries. Likewise, we see leaders of the early church actively involved in overseeing the selection of leaders. Peter in the 11 and Acts 1 and the 12 in Acts 6 in regards to a replacement for Judas and the selection of the seven men. Therefore, the congregation should let the elders lead in this process, but the final affirmation belongs to the church. Now, once having selected elders, the congregation should submit to their leadership, pray for them as they continue in their role. Those references next to prayer is Paul just simply asking, pray for me, pray for an open door, pray that I might have the words to speak. So the congregation should submit to those they've selected and pray for them, particularly Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The congregation has a responsibility to submit to the biblically qualified elders whom they've selected to be over them in the Lord. That's a mouthful. Let's summarize very concisely. While there is no command to have a plurality of elders, every mention of the office in the New Testament models a plurality of elders within a single local church with no examples to the contrary. All singular uses of the term elder, overseer, shepherd either describe the totality of the office, the individual aspiring to or being removed from the office, an apostle such as Peter and John, or Jesus Christ himself. While the Bible speaks uh, uh, to some elders being set apart vocationally, there is only one office. Thus, all are required to meet the same qualifications and share in the same responsibilities. The Bible is silent on the subject of term limits. Thus, the church may exercise wisdom in assigning term limits as needed And finally, God's word requires that all elders meet the biblical qualifications. Thus, the existing elders should lead in the process of selecting new elders in order to ensure that they are indeed qualified. But the final affirmation belongs to the congregation alone. In this, both the existing elders and the congregation are accountable before God. And so we've circulated the... Uh, proposed constitutional amendments for a while now. We've accepted feedback. We've tried to implement those feedback. We've recirculated those constitutional amendments. So we hope that you will see that what we're trying to do as a leadership here is we're trying to get our constitution as much as possible in line with the scriptures, as well as correcting perhaps uh, less uh, desirable practices of the past. And so we hope that you will prayerfully consider Uh, these constitutional amendments as you come this evening to vote from them. Uh, Please take some time to pray this afternoon and be prepared to vote uh, one way or another on these constitutional amendments. In the meantime, I'd like to remind you of the corporate prayer meeting tonight at 4.30. I will have a few more things to say about that in a moment. I will not preach long. I know I've been speaking long already. I will be brief, but I do have a few more words to say. In the meantime... Richard, come lead us.